In today's video, I have seven watercolour rules that you can actually break. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel we do all things watercolour, as well as drawing tutorials, a bit of mixed media, even business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you'll get notified every time I have a video for you. I make at least one free video here a week on YouTube with extra colour mixing content for my Channel Academy members. Click the join button below to find out more. Now, when we start learning something, we all look for rules and rules are a great thing to have when you're a beginner because they get you up to speed a little bit quicker. You can have one sort of fixed idea in your head. You can apply it to everything and get some really good results. But the problem is that that's exactly what people do. They take a rule and they apply it to everything forevermore. But of course they say rules were made to be broken and there are always exceptions to rules. So in this video, we're gonna look at seven common watercolor rules. I'm gonna explain when, and of course, more importantly, why you can break these rules on occasion. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna tell you the one painting rule that you should never break because it will only lead to heartbreak and ruined paintings. So do keep watching to the end for that one. And let's get started looking at rule number one. Now, most of the rules in this video have been put out there by professional artists, but this one seems to me almost more like a bit of an urban myth. I think it's actually something that probably came from beginner artists when they started out and they were struggling with things like drying lines. And the rule is always wet the paper before applying the paint. Now, no professional artist would tell you to do this under all and every circumstance. And indeed, I think it's somewhere where beginners often go wrong. So let's point the camera downwards and look at when you should and shouldn't wet your paper first. So when you first start learning to paint, you'll soon realize that things look much softer if you wet the paper first. Here we are, we can get this lovely soft effect with this paint. But something that people don't often talk about is the fact that the water, as well as softening the paint, is of course diluting it. Now, if I go onto dry paper, then I get darker color with a hard edge. Now within most paintings, you're going to need a combination of these two effects. You're going to need hard edges like this and soft edges like this. The last thing you want to do is wet the entire painting before you start. Now, of course, there might be the occasional subject where you're going to do that, but regularly throughout your painting, you'll need to let certain areas dry. The wetter the paper is, the longer it's going to take to dry. Now, the main time when I find people getting this wrong and wetting the paper when they really don't need to is when they're doing a wet into wet effect. Now, notice the difference in language between the UK and America. In the UK, we always say wet into wet. In America, I've noticed they say wet on wet. Now, is there a difference between those two things? Are they two separate things or two things that are the same? Somebody got very angry with me for using one of the terms wet into wet on my channel once when I was actually painting on dry paper. This is actually an area where I find people make this mistake. So imagine I want to paint yellow and I want to paint this lovely pinky red and I want them to blend into each other. What a lot of beginners will do is wet the paper first like this and they'll put one color in and they'll put the other color in. We can get those colors blending together. Now it seems to work fine and it does work fine. But this layer of water to start with was entirely unnecessary because we can blend those colors together on dry paper and we'll get a much stronger, brighter effect. So this time let's start on dry paper and go in with the pink and look at the difference. So as long as you work quickly and you keep these edges wet, you can get beautiful blended effects even when you're working on dry paper. Of course, we've got a hard edge around the outside. So this works well if you're working in one particular area, but it can also be done across a whole, say, landscape foreground. What you would do in that case is just to keep the paint moving. So say we've got a little horizon at the top and then I'm adding some colors as I go down. And I can just keep the paint moving and get this beautiful blended area. It's going to look so much brighter and fresher than if I diluted the paint by working on wet paper. It's also going to dry quicker, enabling me to put other layers on top and complete my painting much faster. You might say to yourself, well, you're in a very small area there, Michelle. But if I was on a large landscape, I'd just use a much bigger brush. You can do exactly the same as long as you keep that leading edge moving. You can get beautiful wet into wet effects or wet on wet if you prefer to call it that way. Personally, what I call wet on wet is going in perhaps with some wet paint on this wet surface like this. 
but you can get these lovely, bright, fresh effects. You'll see the paint colors so much more clearly than if you pre-wet. Remember, you only need to pre-wet where you need a soft edge. But if you're blending colors together like this example and this example here, pre-wetting the paper simply dilutes your paint, makes everything a bit more damp and messy. Never just randomly wet your paper without considering first if you need to do it. So the next rule that some professional artists will tell you is only ever use 100% cotton paper. And often when I go into Facebook groups and see people having trouble with their results in their paper, so many people will say to them, you must use 100% cotton. And there is no doubt in my mind that 100% cotton paper is better than a wood pulp paper. It lasts longer. It's overall easier to paint on. But we do have to consider things like cost. And actually, if you're using materials that are too expensive, then sometimes what can happen is you're almost afraid to go through that very necessary process of making lots of mistakes as a beginner. And making mistakes is necessary. It's the only way that we learn anything. And if you're staring at a piece of paper that's cost $10 or more, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, I better be careful here. I better not take any risks. And that's not always the best way to learn. So I'm going to talk to you now about the benefits of using a cheaper paper on occasion and some of the things that you can do to mitigate the difference in results that you would get between a wood paper and a cotton paper. So let's take a closer look. So you're looking up close at a very old painting of mine of part of the, uh, the public gardens in Malta and um, I'll move it around so you can see the painting. And can you see how flat the paper is and how bright the colour is? Now this painting is probably not up to my current standards and that's because I painted a very long time ago. I can see by the reference number that I actually painted this in 2006. But yet considering the style difference, it's a perfectly good painting. The colours are vibrant, the paper is flat, there's nothing wrong with this result at all. And I can guarantee that this was painted on cheap old Bockingford paper because that's all I used when I first started painting. So if you need to use a cheaper paper, either due to cost or due to the fact that you don't want to be intimidated by doing lots of practice pieces on very expensive paper, then I've got a couple of tips for you. First of all, you may not notice too much difference when painting on a wood-based paper until the point where you have to lift out mistakes. Papers such as this typically lift out very badly. So if you are practicing and making a lot of mistakes, you want to just live with those mistakes. Just make them and learn from them and move on. Because although you can certainly lift out some mistakes, you're not going to get as much resilience from a paper like this as you are from a cotton paper. You may find that as you rub at it, it starts to sort of lift little pieces of paper. Now, when I'm talking about using a cheaper paper, I'm not talking about buying those unbranded ones that you get in stationers and drug stores. I'm talking about using the practice paper or the wood-based paper that you get from a decent manufacturer because there are papers out there that are really no better than toilet paper. In fact, some of them I think may be a little bit worse. Another thing that's going to enable you to use cheaper, thinner wood-based paper is to stretch it. I guarantee that if I hadn't stretched this piece of paper, this painting would look awful. It would have wrinkled very, very badly indeed. So if you want to use a wood-based paper or even a thinner cotton paper, then paper stretching is the answer. If you don't know how to do it, it's very simple and very easy. It'll also save you a lot of money. You don't have to buy these very expensive thick papers. I'll link to a video that shows you exactly how to do it in the description of this video. As always, I'm popping in at this point to ask if you could please quickly press the like button, the thumbs up button. YouTube rewards channels with audience interaction. So if you like, share, subscribe or leave me a comment, then YouTube will push this video out to more people. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me here on YouTube. If you'd like to further support the channel or get more content all about colour mixing, click the join button below to find out more. Now, similar to our last rule, one rule that I hear people say is that you should only use artist quality paints, the absolute top of the range. Again, we have the same issues with the, uh, the great expense and perhaps being a little bit scared of your paints. But the truth is that students quality paints in many brands are actually very good. And there are one or two strategies that you can use to make the best of a student's quality set if that's what you have. And I'm going to explain how you can move gradually onto artist quality without having to lay out overnight on a huge set and possibly remortgage your house or cause your partner to divorce you. Let's look at some strategies around using students quality paint. So the paints I've used up here are from my essential set by Jackman's and they are an artist quality paint. 
I've got here one of my favorite students quality brands and this is St. Petersburg by White Knights and let's try some of this color out. So this is a red ochre and let's try some phthalo green and you can see they're perfectly bright and clear and usable colors. So here's the thing with students paints. Don't mistake students quality brands by good manufacturers with the cheap rubbish paints that you might get in drugstores and stationers because in most cases they're almost as good as an artist quality range. What you want to do is you want to swatch your colors and have a look if any of them just aren't up to scratch because all watercolor paints are interchangeable with other brands. Let me give you a handy tip here. Often you'll find that some of the blues may not be as good as you expect because many of the blue pigments are very expensive. I'm thinking particularly of anything cobalt based. So your cobalt blue, often your cerulean blue and your ultramarine. You may find that those colors in the student's range are disappointing and you might just want to replace those single colors or with any student's range. There may just be one or two colors that you just don't like. You don't need to replace the whole range. You can swap those out. Now, what if you would like to transition to artist quality, but you really can't afford to buy a full set? All you need to do is to keep using up your student's quality. And then as you run out of one, I might run out of this oxide based red, for example. I can replace it with another brand. So if you need to start with students quality, what you should do is check that you have a good well-known art manufacturer, swatch your colors, remove the one or two that may not be up to scratch. And then thereafter, you can happily paint away with them, make lots of paintings, lots of mistakes. And as each color runs out, you'll be able to replace it. And they won't all run out at once because colors like lemon yellow will run out very quickly. Cerulean also, raw umber. These are weaker colors and you'll get through them fast. Other colors like Prussian blue, phthalo green will seem to last forever because they're strong staining colors. This is good because it gives you that kind of staggering effect so you don't need to replace all of your paints in one go. So one of the first rules that beginners hear when they start using watercolors is you mustn't use white paint. It's a rule, don't use white paint. And this comes from a desire to help that beginner understand the way that watercolor works in that it's a transparent medium. It's not lightened with white paint, it's lightened by adding more water. And any areas of pure white, like those letters on my sign, not actually white paint, we just leave the paper on display. It can be a difficult way of working for beginners. It almost seems backwards to them. And while certainly if you're a beginner, adding white into everything to lighten the colors, or worse still, sticking a load of white highlights on at the end can look terrible. It really isn't a rule that you must never use white paint. I have actually made a whole other video about this subject, so I'll link to that in the description of this one. But meantime, let's have a very quick discussion about white paint and how you should and shouldn't use it in watercolor painting. So I've got some white paint here on my palette. This is titanium white. So you get two types of white watercolor. You get titanium white, which sometimes will be listed as a gouache paint. If you have a white that comes with your paints, it's probably called Chinese white or zinc white. It's a bit less strong and opaque than the titanium white that I have, but my opinion is if you're gonna use white, you might as well make it a good one. So a couple of things that beginners do wrong with white paint is they either use it at the end on top to create white highlights. It may disturb underneath layers. It may not work as well as leaving white paper. So if you tip your painting on the side and catch the light, it's going to look like if you use typewriter correction fluid all over it, it's far from subtle. The other thing is they use it to lighten their colors. Now certainly this works, but you're going to lose the transparency. It's much more effective just to add water. You'll get a color that's just as light, but is much, much brighter. So you can see we get this brighter color here. This one is duller and more opaque. There are actually times when we might need this opacity. We might actually want to be able to go on top of another color and it just always looks a little bit more subtle when you mix some color in as opposed to using pure white. It's particularly effective for splattering and people will rarely notice that you've used white paint. Have you ever seen fruits like plums and grapes that have a soft white opaque bloom on them? That's another time when it might be advantageous to take advantage of that white. Or if you're painting something that's actually a painted object, in the part of the UK where I am, they paint houses pink and they have a strongly opaque look to them. It's very hard to mimic that just by watering down pink like this. Sometimes you actually need that bit of white paint to make them look like the thing you're painting. 
Let me show you now a couple of examples of when I have and have not used white paint in my own paintings. So let's look at a couple of examples of when I didn't use white paint and when I did use white paint. So here's a painting of white roses. Of course, there's a lot of shadow on them. I didn't use any white paint in this painting. I just used the white of the paper. Let's compare this to a painting where I did use white paint. So here I've painted a geisha. Again, this is a very large painting. I'll show you all of it. So it goes right down here and right up here. I'll put a picture up of the whole thing if I can. I used white paint on the geisha's face. Now, why did I do that? Because the geisha was actually wearing makeup. Her face makeup was actually very, very opaque. Also, this softness and the creaminess and the fact that a body colour or a white is much less likely to leave drying lines all meant that this was a fantastic choice for painting her face. I could spend ages getting the shadows and the reflections just right. And I had that opacity. Now, if we go up to the parasol that she's holding, I didn't use white paint at all here. I just used the white of the paper. The white paint was not necessary. So even within a single painting, I can choose to use white in some areas and not in others. The next rule going on from the white paint thing is the black paint thing. So you should never use black paint in watercolour painting. Indeed, many artists refuse to use it at all in any medium. I actually don't agree with that. I do understand why people tell beginners not to use black paint. Again, this is an area where sometimes a beginner will put black into everything to try and darken it or anything that looks very dark and they can't see the colour of it, they will use black. So let's discuss when you should and shouldn't use black paint in watercolour painting because I, for one, don't believe it should be banned completely. So black paint comes in different forms. This one is lamp black. You also get ivory or bone black. And if you're vegan like me, you want to watch out for pigment PBK9 because that's the, uh, that's the one made from animal bones. This one here, as I said, is lamp black. Now, the worst thing you can do with your black is to use it to darken other colors. Now, if we compare our black with some Payne's Gray, you can see the Payne's Gray is much bluer. It's a little brighter and yet we can get it almost as dark as black. It's really important to look carefully at your darks. And see if you can see some colour in them, especially when doing something like a sunset. Black in sunsets nearly always looks awful and you can be tricked into doing it because there are many photographs of sunsets that look like they're jet black. It seems to work for photographs, doesn't work so well when it comes to artist paints. Just like white, black has its uses in painting and it should never be used randomly across the whole painting or mixed into other colours, simply in an effort to get them darker. Let me show you a painting where I used both black and Payne's Grey. So let's look at a real life example of one of my paintings where I used black. So over here in the feathers, I wanted this bird and I'll put a, a full picture up. Oops, I realise it's a large painting and the camera's quite close down. So I'll put a picture up so you can see what this painting looks like. It's one of the ones I was most happy with, actually. I've just noticed as well, of course, I've used white paint here too. Can you see the white? But let's talk about the black. So in the feathers over here, I've actually mostly used Payne's Grey because Payne's Grey is a softer, bluer, less harsh colour doesn't suck the light out like black can. But over here in the animal's eye, I have used pure black. And animal eyes are an area where black works really well because the light reflection is shown by the white highlights. Now on the beak, I noticed something. Whereas the feathers were glossy and the eye was glossy and shiny, the beak had sort of a dullness to it, a matteness to it, and almost a creamy softness. So again, you can see I've used white paint here too. But I have used black paint here and on these feathers here. So one of the few places that I would use pure black is when painting animals. I don't use it on all animals. You might, for instance, have a black Labrador dog and find that you only need very dark blues and Payne's greys with it because black is often very blue. Or you might have another animal such as a cat or a hamster. And you might look at the fur and you think, no, that fur really is black. Then there are items which are physically painted black, such as lampposts and park benches. There is a place for black within watercolour painting. The trick is to use it only where you see it. Don't use it to darken colours. Don't muddy up your palette with it. Keep it in specific places and as you can see, you'll still get a beautiful, vibrant result. 
So we've looked at black and white. Let's look at color mixing now. And one very strong rule that I hear often is you should always mix your own greens. Now I completely understand why people are told this because often the only green that's in a beginner's set is a bright viridian or phthalo green. And I have other videos that explain about this color in more detail. I'll link to those in the description of this one. And actually when I started painting, I did mix all my own greens. But now in addition to that very useful knowledge, I also add some ready-made greens. Let me show you why I don't think you should dismiss them completely. Now, when I first started painting, I mixed all my own greens from yellows and blues. In my first painting set, I had quite a lot of yellows, many different blues, and it was fantastic to learn to paint this way. I highly, highly recommend making a color chart and getting used to all of the yellows, all of the blues in your palette and all of the greens that you can create with them. Something I didn't realize at the time was that green is actually a primary color. Now this video is not long enough to go into that in detail. We're getting into the realms of science here, but all you need to know is that yellow is only a primary color when it comes to mixing artist pigments and artist paints. Imagine if I gave you some green paint and asked you to extract the yellow and the blue from it, you wouldn't be able to do that. We need to start with yellow in order to mix a full range of colors because we're dealing with the physical world of paint pigments. We're not dealing with light. And so that's why a color like this, which is a chrome oxide green or chromium oxide green, is a single pigment color. It doesn't contain blue and yellow pigments. It just contains one single green pigment. So let me swatch it for you. Now, could I mix a color like this by mixing various yellows and various blues? I'm sure I could make something very similar to this. But the thing to remember is that a paint pigment is more than just its color. It's more than just the hue. It's more than just matching the hue. It has properties of transparency and opacity. It has properties of granulation and reflection. And some very beautiful single pigment colors simply can't be replicated. So nowadays, in addition to mixing my greens, I also really love and enjoy using both single pigment greens and mixed greens. They can be really, really useful. Here's one that I designed from my shadow paint set. This is called Forest Green. Yes, I mixed it from different pigments, but also it's really useful to know that I've got it ready mixed and I can just grab it and use it straight from the tube. So when it comes to greens, I really recommend that you start by mixing your own. Make a note of all the different combinations, all the different results you get, and then you can expand your range with some ready-made single and mixed pigment greens. So let's talk now about possibly the biggest and most important watercolor rule, and that's always work light to dark. And actually, it's not just a watercolor rule. If you've done any traditional printmaking like me, I've done some reduction lino printing, working light to dark is a thing in that medium too, and indeed many others. But when it comes to watercolor, sometimes beginners mistake this for thinking that you must build up every color from light to dark. And that's where the confusion comes in. And I see people taking a color that's going to be very dark and building up in 10 layers until they get a dark color. Well, that's just a waste of time. So perhaps you're feeling a little bit confused about this whole light to dark thing. Let me explain it properly for you because it certainly is a rule that you should abide by. But you need to understand exactly what it means. So watercolor is a transparent medium. Unless you mix white paint in, you can't put light on top of dark. Therefore, it's necessary to work from light to dark. The other issue you have with dark colors is that if you paint next to them, they'll bleed quite easily. So it just makes sense to put them in last. However, sometimes beginners misunderstand this theory of light to dark and think that all colors have to be built up in layers. And that's simply not true. So if we look at this red ochre that I painted earlier, there's absolutely no point me, you know, starting out really, really light and then building the next layer up darker. And then on top of that saying, well, I need to go even darker now. It's completely pointless. Certain colors disturb quite badly. You may end up going over the edge of the area you're working in, ending up with a really scruffy edge like this. When I first learned to paint, the chap that was teaching me saw me layering like that and he said, if something's dark, just go straight in with it dark. Yes, my cat has got up from his bed and is now meowing at me again. So don't mistake the fact that you should wait until later in the painting before putting your darks in with an idea that you have to build up darks in layers because you really don't. Now, of course, sometimes there's a specific reason for doing it like this. You might, for example, be adding some 
darker shadow to a lighter area. But if you have an area that's just dark, there is absolutely no need to build it up slowly. You can go straight in with dark paint. And if you say to me, well, the reason I build up in layers, Michelle, is because I just can't get the color strong enough. Otherwise, this is a sure sign that either your paints are of a poor quality or you're trying to get a color to go dark that just naturally isn't a dark color, like a raw umber or some kind of yellow. And putting more layers on isn't going to make it any darker anyhow. So yes, absolutely work from light to dark. Put your darks in later on in the painting, but don't imagine that you have to build them up in layers. You can go straight in with dark paint. So the last rule we're going to talk about, the one that you should never break, the one that I spoke to you at the beginning about, and that's never start painting unless you're happy with your support. So what do I mean by support? I mean the condition of your paper and the condition of your underdrawing. So if you're working, first of all, on paper that's perhaps not been stretched or it's too thin or it's not a very good brand. It's a paper you've used before. You know it doesn't give very good results. Or perhaps the paper's fine, but you're looking at your drawing, you're thinking, oh, I don't really, I'm not quite happy with it, but I expect it will improve when I put some paint on. Let me disillusion you. A bad drawing never gets better when you add paint. It's just going to make the errors more noticeable. So does your drawing need to be perfect before you start painting? Absolutely not, particularly if you're a beginner, but you do need to be happy with it yourself. And if you're not happy with your drawing, you're not going to become happier with it as the painting process goes on. I taught children for years and it's really hard to get children to use colour. Now, you might be surprised by that because when they're very, very small, they love splashing the colour about. But as they get older, even, you know, six or seven years old, they start to realise that a really nice drawing can be ruined by a bad application of paint. And that's the point where they'll say, even right up to teenagers, they'll say, I only really like working in black and white. I don't like paint. I don't like colour. Now, I actually don't believe that, you know, there are many people on this earth that don't like colour. What these people and these children are saying is that they don't like what happens to their very nice drawing when they put colour on it. And this is just an indication, of course, that bad drawings only lead to bad paintings and that even a good drawing can be ruined by a bad painting. So with this knowledge and knowing that the odds are not ever in your favour, give yourself the best chance of success by starting on paper that you're happy with, with materials and brushes that you're happy with, and most of all, a drawing that you are happy with too. So do let me know in the comments about any other watercolour painting rules that I haven't covered in this video, whether you follow them or you break them. Hopefully this video has given you a little bit more clarity about which rules you can sort of push and break a little bit. And don't forget to have a look in the video description before you leave this video, because any videos I've spoken about in this video, any of my previous videos I've referred you to, you'll find links to them down there. You'll also find lots of free stuff that you can grab for no money whatsoever, including some downloadable PDFs and even a free watercolour painting course. And if you need a little bit more help, you can also find out about all of my paid and structured courses, including beginner's drawing and beginner's watercolour painting. And if you'd like to further support the channel or get extra content that's not available on YouTube, all about colour mixing, then if you click the join button below this video, a little box will pop up and you can find out more. If you enjoyed this video, you can watch another one of my watercolour painting videos right now.